stuff you were talking about and something that could be done with the patterns uh, that activate them whatever way, I don't know, take a little investigation. Of you could do it with a, with a miniature batter, you could do it with a, a potato, you could do it with a... Uh, yeah, get a little juice one, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fascinating... Or maybe just, uh, you know, some kind of... Uh, if, if someone's got some training and ability, they can have a, a potential difference between the two fingers on... But that's getting to, you know, the more sublime aspects of it. I'm interested in or maybe you could deal with the pattern very much like the, I've been talking about with the crystal and see whether the pattern would modulate the ELF coming out of your body. I don't have the sensing mechanism yeah, to be able to measure right. that though. Anyway, that's where we kind of abruptly ended. And I'm sure that a lot of you had ideas and questions that we didn't go into. So has anybody got something they want to touch on? Or? I've got one that takes right off from that. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about underground, underwater streams crossing and these uh, fields coming up or whatever they are. And I was thinking about what about water beds? And then also, last summer I was talking to people, how do you shield against weird forces like this? And uh, I was there thinking, is what, no well, I was going to say, what about running water? I mean, if running water makes these things, I mean, you think that running water would, would, would distort or shield or protect or be different? Because literally, I was also thinking earlier when you were talking, how do these things interact in one another? I mean, do they cancel each other or what? But to me, water beds are something to test this whole thing on versus water shields. Okay, the basic facts are uh, most water beds are static. I mean, they rarely find them that flow. Uh, that's why they're there. There's some trap. Uh, water to produce this effect has to flow, and usually in a small channel. That we don't quite understand why. But it, I guess it has to have a tubular form instead of a flat form. Form. And this thing only becomes dangerous, as I said, when the two water streams cross. And it doesn't make any difference what level they cross at. You know, it can be very far apart. So it's a crossing that produces this uh, mixing of signals, which produces a signal that seems to be related to bringing out cancer to the mechanism I've already described with the DNA. Uh, now, how do you keep all these things apart? That's your real question. You know, with all the water pipes going through any system. Let's say a ship. We've got kind of battleship. We've got 50 different kinds of water pipes going by, steam pipes and water and hot and cold and so on. Uh, that is a problem. Nobody's engineered it. It's an unknown art today. Well, as I indicated, the Chinese seem to know this very, very well. You know. 2,000 years ago. So it's something that uh, it's a challenge to us. We have to work it all out. Uh, first, you ob obviously have to have cheap and simple ways of measuring these fields that are going through water. And the kind of stuff we now have now is very sophisticated, very expensive, takes a lot of skill to operate, but I'm sure some bright electronic genius can come out with small clip-on things you could put on a pipe and read out the frequency of the ELF and you could have several of them going. You could cross-correlate data on a computer and so on and so on. But this is the whole agenda for designing, you know, the mechanical side of modern civilization. And the same thing holds for electric power lines of all kinds, you know, that's the best thing. These walls are just loaded with wires going back and forth. So we've got to clean up our environment by learning the science behind this. Is there, is there a consideration about the speed with which the water is flowing or the volume? That no, it, the water doesn't flow very fast usually. It's very unusual to have high water flows. I spy them and have measured water flow. It's amazing how slow it moves underground. So velocity does not seem to be the important thing. The important thing is that it moves, but velocity is not critical. Um, and then the main thing is the mixing between different streams of water. We don't even know the difference, let's say, in direction one way or the other, whether that makes a difference. I don't know. But the first thing you can do, how many of these group people in this room are dowsers? You know, yeah, okay. So there's not dowsers around. First thing you've got to do is douse an area, as I said, lay it all out and find out where the streams are, what the direction is. If you've got a problem, you get out of the air, uh, out of the region, because 
think it's kind of a linear effect, you know, it goes straight up and down above the point where the streams cross. So first precaution <coughs> is to get out of the way if you can, not move to another house. And uh, then after that, hopefully we get scientists and medical people turn on as they've already done in Germany and, and get going in this area, finding out what these very subtle influences are on our health and our you know, general emotional well-being, yes, sir. Well, one thing, you know, Bob Beck was here, you know, and he, he had this little transmitter yeah. in 7.83, and he said that the proximity to that would say, protect against, say, the Russian woodpecker if you have to come into contact. See, I, I love Bob. He's a good friend. He builds most of my equipment and says that I don't think he's right in that one respect, and I, I've done measurements which show what's going on. Let me just give you an idea what the difference is. If you do a spectral analysis of, say, a small region, this table, and we have instruments to do that, find out what the ELF is, okay? If you do an ordinary room, and this is, let's say, 60 hertz here, and this is 120, and this goes down to one, and this is relative amplitude, you can put it in various units. You'll find that a normal room like this will have a profile like this. There'll be a low incidence of one hertz, and I have to put some numbers here, make this 13. And when the Russian woodpecker, on that's the frequency they like the most, about 13 you'll find a bump like this, and then you'll find a bump like this, and you'll find a high distribution of magnetic field from the 60 cycle current, which is all around us, and then it kind of tapers off to about 120. All this is due to either house current, this is doubling, and the Russian wind. Now, in order to uh, protect a human being, you have to do this. And this is where Bob and I differ. You have to, now he'll put in a signal like this, like 7.83 hertz, right? Yes. And that's supposed to help you because it's near the good frequency for a human being. And you have all this other stuff there. Well, when you use his method, all you get is this little peak here, but the rest of this stuff is all the same. It does not go away. And since magnetic waves can penetrate everything, all you're doing, you're kidding yourself because number one, we are in a 7.83 hertz magnetic field in the Earth, which is there and it's unvarying. You're always there and you got the benefit of it. So that's a natural condition. And what he's trying to do is just to add a little oscillator to add a little amplitude. Well, we know that amplitude makes no difference in magnetic uh, field characteristics. In fact, there's in some ways we found that the weaker the field, that the stronger the effect is biologically, because the DNA is tuned to very ultra-weak frequency. So you're still dealing with all this other hash, and this does not really take over and protect all of your DNA and RNA that's open to it. The way to do it is the thing I recently filed a patent on. Here, I'll put a third chart on this so it's very clear. What you have to do is the following. You have the same background curve here, and you have to put in a circuit that does two things. I've already gone over this, so for those of you who already heard me, forgive me. What you have to do is to get a system that will cancel all these signals here, so these are all canceled out. If they're still there, they're still doing their work because magnetic signals can interact, like in this room, we know there are about 10,000 radio and television stations, right? And none of them mix. They don't cancel each other out. And the same way with magnetic waves, when they mix, they don't cancel out. So you have to develop a system first that cancels all this stuff out, and you don't have this here, and then you have to put in a signal, and biologically, 8.0 hertz is more accurate than 7.83 based on certain measurements, and you have to have the only signal you want in the field 
is the 8 hertz signal. See, what Bob does not do is that he has a regular oscillator. You can go to uh, Radio Shack and you can build a little 7.83 hertz oscillator. And there are problems with it. First, it's an electromagnetic wave. It is not a magnetic wave. I've developed a circuit which is a pure magnetic wave, and you can measure it in the brain waves. You can see that they speak of it. But the important thing is you've got to cancel all the other stuff. You don't cancel all the other stuff. You're not helping the patient. And there are about 50 of these uh, pulses like Bob, on the market, in Switzerland, Germany, all kind of places. They all do the same thing. They put a little oscillator and you measure the brain waves of the patient. It does very good. So, the real it, fundamental it, difference It there. does have a biological effect, however. Oh yeah, you can feel it. Sure. But you can also feel all the other stuff. You haven't got rid of that. Yeah, I know that, yeah, you know, now my clinical experience is limited, but uh, at least six out of six people who have had headaches, uh -huh. it, it, the headaches have just completely disappeared within about two minutes. Yeah, and, but, and but that's for whatever. Yeah, that's for another reason. See, what you've done, I mean, this is very clinical. You've injected this signal, which is good for you, agree? And if you have a problem where you don't have, I know you've looked at thousands of EEGs and their spectral distribution, but very few people, only very high meditators, have a very prominent 8 hertz signal in their EEG spectral analysis. Most people are kind of flattened out and smeared over the EEG spectrum from about 1 to 40 hertz. So a person like that is having some, oh, I don't know what the cause of the headache are. I think you presume that it's Russian ELF. I no, don't know. no, five of them were just plain, well, four of them were tension headaches, and yeah. one of them was sort of a, uh, a jet lag headache. Okay. That's a tension headache. So that, see, that would work in a case like that because when you have this frequency, this frequency, it will relax you because this is a balancing frequency. But what I'm saying is that, yes, you get rid of the headache, but all this other stuff is working on the 10 trillion or so, you know, DNA uh, molecular change in your body. So really, to be effective, you've got to do the thorough job. Actually, uh, I'm just showing you a small part of the spectrum. You really should have a system that wipes out all electromagnetic frequencies from one hertz right up to uh, high infrared, you know including microwaves, radio waves, that kind of, all the crap that's in the air. They're all at such low signal strength that they can affect. There's some molecule in the body, and I'm talking about a DNA molecule, that will resonate at one of those frequencies. And we know a lot of the frequencies that the body resonates at. So to really have a uh, pollution-free environment as far as electromagnetics is concerned, you need wave-canceling systems that, that really put a little bubble or shield around it. And I think I've achieved that in this new development that I have. And, uh, I haven't really had a chance to talk to Bob about it, but I discovered it after I last saw him last <laughs> June. And he wasn't at a meeting where I announced the work, so I have to catch up with Bob on that. The fact that I want Bob, I'm going to give Bob one of my devices and have him check it to you know, prove out what I just said. Well, one other yeah. thing, oh, yeah. So I think a little off the subject of the, this whole area here is under an aquifer that is flowing a little northwest to southeast. And as far as I know, I maybe mean, there's some experts here. There's no Where did the aquifer flow from? From North or south or east? No, it's a little northwest to southeast. I mean, this whole That's area in Minneapolis. goes so that way. Yeah, to, uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's done, it's about 200 feet. How fast it's flowing, I don't know. But all the wells that are dug in this area are fundamentally into that aquifer. Yeah, I don't think aquifers are a problem, although there have not been a lot of studies done on it, because they are a flat sheet, they're not a tube. The velocity is, you know, probably inches per hour. They don't flow yes. much. Uh, I don't think aquifers are a danger. The fact is they might might really be a beneficial kind of a place to live on because they would absorb the uh, you know, planetary uh, 7.8283 hertz signal and uh, get charged up with it and maybe act a little bit like the uh, pulsar system that we just discussed.
Some are living on a boat or on a boat. Is it, is it a different effect for them? Now that's a very interesting question. I never think of things like this. Thanks. For <laughs> There's some very unusual phenomena. I spoke about part of this at the lecture you read before, Alan, in the cancer business. I told you about this Dr. Maynard Murray, who uh, found out uh, after 40 years of research that no creature that lives in the sea develops. Uh, cancer, very unusual phenomenon. But if the creatures who live in the sea, like certain dolphins, migrate to fresh water and become accommodated, then they develop cancer. And this is true for salmon, for example, which I mentioned earlier. Now, if you're on a boat in salt water, you don't have any problem with uh, these geopathic zones because it's like an aquifer, it's a huge sheet of salt water, and you don't get these freak effects. Now, if you're over fresh water in a boat, you know, some inland lake like Lake Michigan or Superior, whatever, then you have an under, underwater shallower system that can have the possibility of geodetic, a geopathic crossing stream. So, uh, I would say generally, the study, the epidemiological studies have been done on people who live on boats, like sailors who live there for years. So the cancer they're most susceptible to is from the sun, the ultraviolet uh, bouncing off the uh, <clears throat> surface of the water, and they have a high incidence of lip cancer and skin cancer and so on. And that's a radiant uh, light energy effect. But you don't get uh, a high distribution of uh, other types of cancer for people who really live on the sea, probably for the same reason that, uh, uh, well, two reasons. One is incidents of so-called geopathic zones are less, uh, but secondly, you're always moving on a boat, and therefore you don't stay over one spot very long. See, there's quite a difference in that factor alone. So I would say that uh, and somebody really has got to prove this rigorously with a you know, tremendous battery of statistics that probably the incidence of cancer, people who really live at sea and work at sea, given all other factors are equal, that is the pipes in the boat and all the circulation of the ELF and so on, is relatively neutralized, I think uh, you'd find that they would have a lower, much lower incidence of, uh, of cancer. Whereas over river boats, uh, fresh water, lakes, so on, I think you'd have about the same <clears throat> incidence of cancer that you would have in a normal country area. I mean, as opposed to a city with all its smoke and fumes and toxic agents and so forth, you know, like New Jersey, for example, which has the highest incidence of cancer in the country just because all the petrochemical plants are concentrated right there in the northern part of New Jersey in the drug industry and so on. So there are a lot of things like that we got to learn about. We don't know what, what would happen if you were in a space capsule, for example, and spent 50 years orbiting the Earth, whether, since you're free of all these geopathic zones and so on, whether that would lower the incident. But then you have the fact of the motion and the unusual environment and a lot of other things taken into consideration. Did you say ELF does not uh, I'll be the inverse square law. No. You can, I mean, it's been done by many engineering groups. Uh, you can, uh, a million meters is not that big a time base, but measurements have been done, particularly bouncing signals, ELF signals off the Val Van Allen belt, which is a good magnetic reflector. You get virtually no measurable attenuation. I'm talking about power, right? We're talking about power, attenuation, inverse square law. Uh, that's one of the things that, it's a very baffling type of signal. Uh, as I told you earlier, <clears throat> it's, it, it's known not to be an electromagnetic type of wave. It's not exactly a field the way a magnetic field radiates. The current thinking, and I think it's still subject to revision, is that the that the radiation, or I prefer to call it emissions, is more like what are called solitons. Solitons are energy package, packets, usually kind of in the form of torus, that will go through each other without affecting each other, or they will go through material and all kind of things, 
where the fields in the material don't distort them or change their characteristics. So they're very, uh, it's a new kind of wave, really. I, I've been to a physics conference recently, and they're just sitting and arguing about what is a soliton and what is a magnetic wave, you know, that has some frequency characteristic. It's not really defined yet. Well, pardon my ignorance, but in other words, you're saying you can't create a magnetic wave by turning an electromagnet off and on in this pulsing cycle. That it has a vector it. component. It has electric vector. as a magnetic vector. The only vector that's active, biologically speaking, like an ELF in that kind of a wave is the, is the magnetic vector. It's not like a classical electromagnetic radiation. No, it doesn't follow the Maxwellian equation. In fact, is the Maxwellian equations, for those of you who know them, were the first successful unification of electricity and magnetism, and they were always thought to be symmetric. That means everything is balanced, but it's not balanced because electricity is produced by <coughs> electron charge, but nobody knows what causes the uh, magnetic component to occur except the fluctuation of the electrical field, which does produce magnetism. But so that gave rise to the whole theory that there's got to be something called a monopole in the universe that is a magnetic unit with only one charge, either north or south. And nobody's ever found one yet. They've been looking for about 20 years. That was a prediction made by Dirac way back in 32. We still can't find it. So does, does that answer the question? Yeah. To generate. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> no. Anyway, to generate a magnetic wave. You have to have a magnetic wave oscillator. Which is uh, something different than an electromagnet that's being turned off and on at a given frequency. Uh, not exactly. Let me be very precise about it. If you take a, uh, you know, the ceiling fans that turn around, right? Mm -hmm. They turn very slowly. Mm -hmm. And they're run, they have an armature and it has field coils around it. Mm -hmm. And those, uh, <coughs> Uh, the armature cuts the field lines of the coils at a certain rate, and that makes the thing turn. Those things, that type of device, even though it's an electromagnetic magnetic device, and it has a stator and a rotor, you know, that will produce ELF signals. And that's one of the real pain in the necks to people who have these gadgets slowly going around or in restaurants, and depending on the frequency of the spin, which you control with the rheostat, you get some very dangerous ELF waves out of it. Really magnetic waves. So see what I'm saying? It's not exactly clear cut. Okay. If you do take a bar magnet, okay, and you rotate it as a rotor with some kind of stator, yes, you get magnetic waves. Yeah. Related to this same picture here, you know, outside or in a house without electrical wiring or electricity, you still get a 60 cycle electric power yeah, magnet. You go out in the middle of the field, you go 100 miles from the whole planet is guy? Oh, planet is saturated. But in Europe, they've got 50 cycles, so we've got 50 cycles. they got 50 cycles, they right. Do. So, is, now, again, it's a simple, simple question again. Do we have as much 50 cycles as they do, or is there a, a where, uh, as far as you are from it, the less effective it is in some manner or other, even though it may measure the same on an instrument? Are we still uh, more influenced by 50, by 60 here than they are in Europe? I mean, I've heard people say things like that, that you know, they've got different kind of conscience from Europe because they got 50 cycles and we got 60 cycles. Yeah. So, you know, whether it's measurable or whether it's measurable by, you know, cytronics or whatever, is there any consideration on that? No, not really. Uh, since these signals, when they are magnetic waves, and that's what we're really talking about, <clears throat> across the Atlantic, yes, we can get 50 cycle signals here, and that's part of the hash in that curve. Uh, uh, and we can be affected by it, and the stuff from here gets over there, 60 affects them. It turns out that 50 cycles is more biologically active. In other words, the lower you go in frequency, the more active this thing is in terms of latching into the uh, DNA molecule. But you see, you have, uh, the only way I can describe it is that there's so much hash, I, I use a number, just 10,000 uh, signals going through this room, which is fair. It's about the average number of stations that can reach here and affect us. And there's such weak, weak signals, which is very important to remember, and until very recently you couldn't even measure them. It took this rather new, sophisticated type of detectors uh, to measure the, uh, the magnetic component of all these signals. 
we are being polluted. Uh, I should draw a large scale and show you that we're being polluted all the way through AM radio waves to megahertz radio waves, uh, uh, very high frequency, ultra high frequency, all the way up to the infrared band, which is an all electromagnetic oscillation. And what the net result of this mix is, I don't know. I don't think anybody has ever taken the trouble to measure every signal signal that's coming into this room or whatever the laboratory platform is, and then do the next thing, which is like Mission Impossible, evaluate the role of every one of those on some biological system, and then evaluate chunks, you know, various octaves of the effect. I'll give you a small example. There's a guy in uh, uh, Spain who, uh, name is Delgado, an old friend of mine, a brilliant researcher from Spain, but he was in Yale, that's where I first met him for about 20 years. And you may remember him as the guy who implanted radio receivers in the heads of bulbs, and then he had a little radio transmitter in his hand, and he would <coughs> get the bull anger to, to charge at him. He'd just stand there, you know, with a laboratory smock coat on, no sword or nothing, no cape, and he'd just press a button, and he would influence the bull to go from anger to passivity, and the bull would just stop in his track and say, what's going on? You know, I like that guy. What am I charging him for? And he actually demonstrated this in a very famous bull ring in Spain. So anyway, that's the kind of stuff that Delgado has been doing. And I gave a lecture in Madrid, I think it was 81, spring of 81, and I had quite a bit of time. I gave my lecture on the CLF stuff, and Delgado gave his on some other work he was doing, and we had a couple of hours together to talk about it, and we did a panel together, and he learned for the first time about these incredible biological effects of ELF. And being a good researcher, he went to work like crazy, and what he's working on is using Drosophilia flies, and he stimulates them with these various uh, frequencies. He can stimulate them. He's found frequencies that can make the fly's eye change from green to purple. In other words, he can manipulate the entire genetic structure of the fly by using the right frequency. Now, we're exposed to all the same stuff that the flies are, really, except that's in an isolated environment where you minimize the background noise, right? And there are ways of doing that experimentally. You just put the whole experiment in a Faraday shield, and it will cut out everything above 40 hertz and let the lower stuff go through, so you can specifically stimulate specific genetic structures and so on. And he's just opening up, some of this is given in that Omni article I mentioned to you, February Omni, which you should get and show the picture of Delgado. But that's the kind of research that's going on now. You can actually create genetic mutation in creatures like flies and been done in mice and been done in rats by just beaming them with such a weak beam that they're only ultra sophisticated equipment. So that's the kind of nutty world we have developed, okay? And all this stuff is brand new knowledge, all of it, seven years old at the most. With the recent cancer statistics show that with the exception of cancer of the lung, that on a unit basis or population basis, that practically all cancer, the incidence of cancer is dropping. And particularly in terms of stomach cancer, it's quite dramatic. Yeah, I saw those statistics. It's not really that dramatic if you look at it closely. So, I mean, with stomach cancer? With stomach cancer is right. tremendous, yeah. But don't forget, there's other aspects here. I don't have to give it all to you so you don't get confused. Uh, I mentioned in the lecture on cancer on Thursday that every chemical has its own ELF frequencies. They're called ELF coupling constants. And they are the frequencies that bind various molecules together, not by normal valence chemistry, but just by oscillating field. For example, in a simple carbon atom, let's say this is a carbon atom, here's hydrogen, 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 here's carbon, carbon, carbon. Each of these hydrogens is linked by a magnetic wave, which can be measured in a nuclear magnetic resonant instrument. And the normal coupling frequency for about 90% of the atoms in the body 
is about 8 hertz between hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. If you get a nitrogen here, it's a different frequency. But the entire frequency band is about 200 hertz. It's not very big. Of all the chemicals in the body, we don't know how many trillions and trillions of chemicals they are in the body, okay? Those are little radiators, just like the Russian oscillators or the little Bob Beck oscillator, that radiate out these various frequencies. They're, they're pretty large range. Now, you eat some of these kind of food that has these radiators in them, where's it going to hit first? The throat and then the esophagus and then it's going to get to the stomach and there it stays a few hours. So the little radiators in the chemistry of the food that we eat can be a source of cancer. I'll give you one example. There's a substance which is a gas used to preserve food called ethylene oxide, right? We've all heard about it. A lot of stuff in the paper about it. Ethylene oxide radiates at 41 hertz. And it's really one of the most potent carcinogens we know. Well, as a result of all this ELF work in the last few years, there's been a big cry to ban ethylene oxide as a food preservative. Because it just sits there and radiates the food with 41 hertz, which is a very bad frequency in terms of carcinogenesis. And uh, it is a known carcinogenic agent. And if you eat something that's been exposed to it that sits in your stomach for a while, if you're susceptible, of course, the body has marvelous resistance and put out, puts out its counter force troops to, uh, but that is the, one of the reasons I think that the cancer of the stomach incidence, is, besides early diagnosis, which, you know, is always a problem, right, with cancer of the stomach. They used to ask us in medical school, would you rather have cancer of the stomach or cancer of, cancer of the rectum? Well, it turns out that the mortality and morbidity from cancer stomach was so great that you didn't discover the damn thing until it was almost too late, whereas the rectal thing you could discover early. So anyway, between early diagnosis, which I think is important, and kind of the cleanup of a lot of the food preservatives, you know, there are some 32,000 known chemicals that are additives to our food supply. And virtually all of our food supply, except the uh, fresh orange that you pick off the tree and nobody's ever sprayed has some, got some kind of chemical and nobody and of the there's a vast number of food additives only about 200 have ever been screened for carcinogenic potential and none, of those 200 practically none have been screened for their ELF radiation power so you see how primitive we are with an early stage of really understanding just the simple problem of cancer, to say nothing of genetic deformities and uh, mental retardation, all kind of problems that are very common in our society. So anyway, we've got a big house cleaning to do and somehow get back to the primitive state of Adam and Eve when there was no industry and no food additives and the only chemicals you got were billions of years in the making and the biological organism had gotten used to that. But we've produced so much junk, I mean, it's appalling. If you go through the tables of the stuff that we've produced, I mean, it's staggering. You know, just the chemical formulas of what we've dumped into our food, whether it comes in from the water or pesticides or preservatives or things that make the plastic hold up better or the color brighter, or, you know. It's a monstrosity. There's, there's no science, there's no health standard to screen this stuff out. And being in a laissez-faire society where anybody can do what he wants to and the regulatory agencies are very limp and don't want to stir up big business and so on, you've got a mess on your hands. And uh, very little is being done about it. But at least we ought to be alert that these things exist and something can be done about them. And one of the things is, uh, and very important, is... Uh, devices that will cancel all the CLF radiation from all these chemicals that are in us, around us, and so on. And the other thing is to, it's, it's what call, what's called pulling. In radio, you have a center peak of carrier power, and then on each side, you have a little sideband that has the information. And pulling is when you pull the sideband information closer to the center carrier frequency. In this case, the center carrier frequency is about 8 hertz, and you want to have it so strong in the body that it pulls all the other frequencies in 
so you don't have these sideband things that can be dangerous, okay? Well, I don't know that I'm getting way off the track, but I hope it makes sense what I'm saying. Yeah, could you say just a little more about what sort of device is used as a pure magnetic wave emitter, or is it too complicated to go into? I'm sorry, pure magnetic waves what? Emitter. Oh, emitter, you mean radiator. Yeah. Uh, what sort of device are the Russians using? Okay, I could say <laughs> what that. The Russians are using something that was embedded in Colorado Springs, Colorado, in 1900 by Nikola Tesla. And what he did was the following. This is a huge apparatus, hundreds of feet high. What he did was have a coil, called a secondary coil like this, and around it, he had a large primary coil, like this. And one end of this was ground with the earth, one end ground with the earth here. And then he had a high tower built up here, which supported this thing. And on the top of it, he had what we call an air capacitor. Just think of it like a little bowl of metal. So he then had an input from an alternating current source, let's say it was 110 volts and one side was grounded. So he would start running the generator here at 60 cycles, it would pump up this primary coil, which would put out, let's say, 10 hertz frequency signal, and by the ratio of the windings, this secondary coil had produced in it about a 25 kilohertz signal, and then he would radiate that. Uh, and it would go from one end of the earth to the other because this was very powerful. It's something of the order of, uh, uh, let's say, a million watts. A megawatt. Lots of power. And then he showed that he could walk, walk, took a car. <laughs> he went about 30, 40 miles away and he had a light bulb in his hand. That was just a regular light bulb, you know, like this. And had a little socket on the end. But on the end, he wound a little coil that would pick up this signal, 25 hertz. And he would hold it in his hand, 100 watt bulb, and it would light up 100 watts. And the current was going through him. And because it was 25 kilohertz, it didn't bother him. It wouldn't bother anybody for the nature of that frequency. Uh, so that's what started the whole thing. And then Tesla did studies, uh, he called this a magnifying transmitter, Tesla magnifying transmitter. He then had friends uh, he running this experiment in Colorado Springs, he had friends in Africa, and he would send them a signal after having sent them a detector so they could tell when the signal from Colorado Springs got there. And he was, Tesla was the master of clock maker, he designed all the electronic clocks that were ever built, and we still use the same principle. So anyway, he would uh, send the signal, let's say, at this point, he would travel down to South Africa, and they'd measure the time of arrival. And, you know, they'd write back or send a telegram. And what they found out, and uh, nobody's ever re repeated this, they found out that the signal, electronic signal from Colorado Springs to South Africa would arrive there at 27 times the speed of light to see, mm -hmm. which according to Einstein is impossible, and according to Tesla was possible, and they proved it. Now, nobody paid any attention to Tesla for a lot of reasons, I don't want to go into that, uh, but the Russians, because Tesla was a Yugoslav, therefore he was a Slav, therefore he was an uh, interesting, acceptable person, studied all of this stuff. He published thousands and thousands of pages of patents and books and drawings and so on. So anybody who reads this stuff can duplicate this thing. So they said, well, let's try it. Let's see if it's worthwhile. And then we don't, we don't know exactly when they started. But my guess would be they started sometime in the 1950s. And by 1976, they had a fully operational Tesla tower, which they did not have above ground. They actually have them in 
big holes in the ground. But this thing now does not send any signal through the air. I didn't make that clear. All the signals sent through the earth. And the earth handles it in a kind of a funny way. I'll just make it quick. Uh, here's the earth again. And here's the Russian tower. Let's say it said Riga. What it does is it sends this signal, and they usually use the same signal, 25 hertz, but they chop it at uh, 10, 13, 14 pulses per second. So that's what it is. It goes right through the earth and through a very peculiar mechanism. It doesn't just shoot through. A certain part of the signal is reflected back, and that's part of the transmitting signal. Transmitting signal comes out here, Part of it goes through the air and forms a little band there and a little band there. And the net signal that reaches us goes around the earth in a great circle root like this. So anything inside the circle does not get the ELF that they're sending, but everybody outside the circle gets it. And they designed this thing so it come right down to Ottawa comes uh, west of Montreal, down the Hudson Valley, and right from New York City, a little bit down toward Philadelphia, and then swings across the Atlantic Ocean, goes through a gang that comes all the way back to China, and so on, all the way back to the point of origin. So that's how the Russian signal is sent, and that's the way ours is sent. We've duplicated uh, the signal. And ever since this signal was unleashed on the Earth, which is July 4th, 1976, that was the kind of a bicentennial <laughs> present that the Russians, somebody had a good sense of humor, right? They unleashed this on the earth. And that's when I first became aware of it. I was working in Canada for the Canadian government on a power transmission problem, and the signal suddenly came over the air, and we didn't know what the hell was going on. Total chaos and panic for about three months. And that's when I really got into this work, although I've been a student of Tesla for the previous 30 years. But that's the whole thing in a nutshell, how you can broadcast from the Soviet Union to here or anywhere on the planet. And what you do to steer it, you build several of these, and you put them out of phase, just like FM broadcasting, and you can steer the signal around the different points of the planet. And the Russians have been doing a lot of experiments. They've been testing to see if they could cause earthquakes, which they can, because Tesla said he could do it. Uh, they've been testing to see if they could blow up grain elevators, which have a lot of powdery stuff in it that's very easily explosive, and they've done that. And they've had quite a few incidents like that. They've worked the hardest on modifying the uh, weather, which means that where the signal goes around the Earth, they interfere with the jet stream, which, you know, zips through the stratosphere at a high velocity and makes our weather. I mean, the jet stream comes down from the north and goes way down to Florida and then swings back, brings the cold weather to Florida and the crop is killed and so on. So they've been doing these delightful experiments and uh, uh, raising hell with this planet, literally, and also keeping Western intelligence totally off their feet for example, I did the experiments to prove that the Soviets were doing this in about one week. Bob Beck and I did it. We built the equipment, we designed the experiment. It took us one week to get very clear-cut results. We gave that to the CIA, the intelligence community, the Canadian government, the British government, everything. You know, it took them three years to duplicate what we did in the work. That's called bureaucratic inefficiency. I mean, to this day, they say, God, I never believed you guys. And finally, after three years, we prove that you could entrain the brain of an individual and get this kind of effect. And now, of course, I said they're coming out with it, and so eventually it will become public domain. But you don't have to have a, this is a 100 megawatt, this is the Tesla transmitter, but the Soviets have gotten up to 100 megawatts, that's big. And they've got, as far as we know from intelligence reports, about nine of these in operation, the U.S. has three and being back and forth with each other. But as you know from Bob Beck's work, you can produce a variable oscillating signal that can produce all these frequencies in a gadget about this big, that includes the batteries and all, the thing will run for a year, and you can raise hell with any biological system you want with that little gadget. And uh, 
anyway, that's uh, the shape of things that are now, and, and I hope that all this warfare use will be converted and it gets into the hands of the medical profession. I hope the National Cancer Institute is informed of this, as of the moment they have not been informed by the Navy, and the National Science Foundation and a few other people, that we can really get cracking and put our resources and minds to this problem and turn the whole thing around to be a defensive, protective situation, not only against the ELF, but against all the other pollution that I mentioned before that we all live with. When uh, Rudolf Steiner was doing his thing, he died in 1924. But the last five, ten years of his life, he was railing against the generation of electricity. And nobody really understood what he was talking about. That guy was smart, yeah. But he, he made a rather interesting statement. He said, if you knew what you were generating, you would stop it instantly because you're destroying the earth. But he also said there's a natural form of electricity. Now, can you tell me what the difference between electricity and a natural? I mean, do you know? Do you have an idea what he was alluding to? The natural kind of electricity. Well, first, you know, he was a great what we call psychic. Mm -hmm. He was a mystic in terms of being a philosopher about things that are hidden. And all these things that I'm drawing in terms of numbers and frequencies and amplitudes. All these things can be sensed by any sensitive psychic. I mean, you can calibrate people to feel which are the good frequencies, which are the bad frequencies, and so on. And these things exist always naturally in small ways and small pockets, but not like now where it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous. So he could sense these things, and he knew which frequencies were bad, right? And he knew which were good. For example, remember the famous experiment he did in Prussia, I can't remember the name of the state, the owner, but the guy's place was being overrun with rabbits, remember that story? And they couldn't get rid of them by shooting, by dogs, by poison, blah, blah, blah. So uh, they got Steiner out there and he set up a few iron stakes in the ground and he did a little meditation and rabbits vanished, right? Remember that story? Mm -hmm. Well, if you know how to control these frequencies, you can do that. Now, I, for example, have been plagued where I live, and it's a silly part of my life, with mice. They want to come into this house, which is in the middle of nowhere. And for two years running, I've gone bananas with the poisoning and the traps and blah, blah, blah. And I like mice. They're cute little guys, right? They say, why do you have to live with me? Why don't you go somewhere else? So anyway, I set up a little crystal oscillating setup, and I don't want to go into frequency because I'm doing some happening on it, but I found a frequency that would keep mice away. And I put this thing up with just a little crystal, a little oscillator, no power, and I got no mice. They went away. Yeah, they're they're happy, I'm sure. In the secret life of plants, they had a machine. See, here's what I, this is what fascinates me. Uh, in order to clear a an field, area. Huh? An, area yeah. an area, they'd like take a photograph, something like this, take a little teeny teaspoon, of insecticide or something, yeah. and turn on the transmitter, and it would clear. Yeah, that was brilliant that work that was done by General Gross in Pennsylvania, and they did it commercially for years. And then the anywhere, FDA, anywhere, anywhere. Yeah, then the FDA came in. And yeah, and the FDA shut it down yeah. because they were bad for the chemical industry, right? Hmm. Now I, I approve of things like that, but I also would want to know, which they don't know, because you know the psychotronic people are not exactly scientists, they don't know what they're putting out. Right. And they don't know what backscatter, what negative effects could possibly be going on just because they've hit a certain beetle with a certain insecticide, you see. And since those psychotronic or radionic energies don't again follow the inverse square law, uh, they could be bouncing to some other part of the planet and causing effect. Anyway, it's a powerful thing, and people laugh at it. All you got to do is duplicate the experiments. No big deal. It's very simple to do. In fact, there's a group of us, uh, those of you who are from Canada or the northern region, know that there's been a devastating infestation of spruce budworm that started in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and been going across the country and has now reached the Rockies. And I've seen the devastation in the evergreen trees all the way through. And it's terrible when you're at the top of the Rockies, it's beautiful, and these trees are dying from spruce budworm. 
Well, anyway, what we did is the same kind of experiment. We got the Department of Agriculture from New Brunswick to monitor the experiment. They picked a couple of square miles of forest that had been infestated, infestated with spruce budworm. We got the picture. We did the reading on this gadget. And what's interesting is this. The absolute number of spruce budworm in the treated forest and the control forest were the same. The same. But the, the treated forest did not die. The untreated forest died. And what we found out was that we didn't know how to, you know, sources apprentice with this gadget. But we found out that the tree's immune resistance to the spruce budworm was improved. Well, you think that would cause a great sensation to save all the forests of Canada, right? No way, baby. The chemical industry got in there, lobbied, killed the whole idea, cast aspersions on the experiments, even though it's totally monitored by, you know, Department of Agriculture people. So these things can be done, and they're very simple. It doesn't require any great genius or, you know, any... Well, that's what I... How it works, we don't know. But, well, that's a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Something I'm trying to figure out here is how these waves, or whatever they are, how the elves, how they move, in terms of, like, that Soviet, the Soviet experience, they're able to have some directionality in terms of how they the go at first. Then they reach black and then so on. But how come they don't ever get hit back with their own garbage? I mean, I keep thinking they're going to be going everywhere eventually, or something. Yeah, well, I don't think this has really been worked out. Uh, the physics is very complicated because first place, from starting with Tesla, right here, measure the velocity of light of radiation, electromagnetic rays, 25 times the speed of light. We have no instruments that can measure the actual propagation of that wave because all instruments can only measure things below the speed of light. Problem A. So, empirically, we know that he did it, other people can do it, he did it in the Canadian government. The signal will travel superluminal, faster than the speed of light. How it reflects, we don't fully understand yet, because we don't know what the signal at this velocity really is like. We, don't, we have no experimental lab to test the idea. Then when it gets here, and you have this interaction between the airborne wave and the groundborne wave, and you get a, what's called a standing wave around the planet. We don't really know. This is like uh, radar was back, uh, Hertz, you know, discovered radar, literally, uh, in 1982. And he didn't know what he was doing. He was just following Maxwell's equation. And now we know a lot about radar, you know. In fact, it's driving me a lot. So we're in the same really primitive state. We don't have the data. There's not the interest of the, uh, uh, for example, you would think in the IEEE, that's Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, the biggest scientific body in the United States, and you think that they would be interested in this problem, right? And within the uh, IEEE, I met the president of the IEEE, and he's a Tesla buff, they're the ones who got Tesla's picture on the stamps and so on. You think that they would take up this problem and work at it? We've got all the resources of the government, the satellites and everything. But none of them, they know this experiment. None, none, none of them, to my knowledge, to this day, have done the experiment. So I don't know why there's this reluctance to look in a phenomenon that might upset Einstein's relativity theory with the limiting velocity of light. But there is some kind of reluctance to make big waves uh, you think that's the first thing scientists <laughs> want to do is make big waves, you know? Show the dummies how wrong they are. At least get at the truth at the other end of the spectrum. So I, I can't really answer your question because there's no data, there's no interest, there's no funding, there's nothing. Well, something else I would think the U.S. would respond in a counter way or something. When I think of U.S. consciousness, you know, we Why? Why do I think that? No, no, why do they do it? Don't you? No, I'm, are, we, are we doing that? In yes, we are. Yeah. I thought you asked why we're doing it. No. We're doing it because if one side develops a weapon, this is a weapon. No, I think I know. The other side's got to have the same weapon, even though the, they might be, you know, like nuclear weapons, mutually destructive. 
It's part of, you know, the sick part of the human mind, particularly the military mind. And so, uh, well, there were a number of things that I, I was involved in all that craziness. But the first thing was our military, and we did a lot of briefings at the Pentagon, couldn't believe that this simple scheme would do what the Russians are doing. So they had to put up a lot of money and duplicate it first. And they found out, yeah, the Russians are doing it, Tesla was right, etc., etc. Once they got them going, then they want to know how this little toy works, right? You have to see if you can knock out installations in the Soviet Union, whether they're having their people go nuts or some people are going here, whether the disease occurred. So they built one that was at uh, Alice Springs, uh, Australia, a big secret uh, Australian research. So that, uh, then they had to have another one, so they put up another one in South Africa, which is one of the reasons we have friendly relations with South Africa, in case you're interested, because they tolerate our presence there, because from a base in South Africa, you can hit a certain part of the Soviet Union that's of great interest to in the And now we got another one going up in Antarctica. So anyway, the damn thing ex escalates. It's like when we started the nuclear age, we had one bomb, right, the fat boy, and now we got, I don't know, 50,000 of them on each side, and they just keep piling up, and crazy machine <laughs> military people, you got to have more and more, and you don't know what you're doing most of the time. Bad psychology, oh, yes, sir. A couple questions. Um, this, this radionic, you took, uh, as you, your experiment did with the forest, you know, you, you, you got a certain hertz out of the, the oscillations of a particular chemical. If you take, say, a chemical, which is, say, or a number of chemicals which are used in cancer chemotherapy, and you thought of this, anyway. No, I haven't. Yeah, but you've got a great thought there, right? Okay, but, but I mean, just to extrapolate that. Say, yeah, just a use the good effect, effect and not the negative yeah. side effect. Sure, right. right. Yeah. Some kind of bi biological yeah. uh, or organisms and yeah. ne neoplastic disease. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the same response would be is that you maybe stimulate the immune system or, or somehow or nullify the effects and the effects of yeah. uh, the cancer itself. Yeah. Or I presume that there are probably is a different PLO effect of neoplastic tissue normal. Absolutely, yeah. that, that, that we have been able to measure right and, and that uh, perhaps the, uh, by using some of these agents that uh, you could actually destroy the neoplastic tissue. Well, that's a brilliant idea because, I mean, to go at it technically, what I would do would be the following. First, I'd take agents that are known to have maximum, you know, uh, Neoplastic cytal effects and minimal effect on yes. normal tissue. And you run it through a regular nuclear magnetic resonance and you get the complete spectral readout and you see where the peaks are. And we know that we'd be looking for certain frequencies uh, that would maximally get rid of the neoplastic tissue and not do anything. And you'd have a spectrum, okay? Then you get the right mix to optimize all factors. It's been measured every bit of it. That's an important thing on an NMR signal. Once you know that this thing has been affected, you know, clinically from years of practice. And then you take that thing, you put it in one of these little radionics boxes, which is nothing, believe me. You know, uh, you can put the sample itself, and as you say, get a bunch of mice or whatever you want to work at, and see if you could irradiate them with this X unknown radiation without getting all the bad side effects, yeah. you could follow them. And, you know, like mammary uh, cancer mice would be great. It's all on the outside. You can see in front. It's a great idea. Now, when, when Bob Beck was here, he described this, like this Bukowski coil. Yeah. Which is a... That's, that's different. A test, is that not a... That's called a multi-wave oscillator. Okay, yeah. And he, he treated tumors, as you probably heard him say, yes. on plants. That was the extent of his work. At that he time. said he did it on humans too. Oh, he did. He said, I didn't know that. Yeah. You he mean said Bob did? Bob did. Yeah. Oh yeah, he he's got like close people. Yeah. I yes, and that he that there were some people he say that had multiple distant metastases mm -hmm. that had actually been cured of this treatment. Yeah. I just want to point out that the difference is that the Lakowski coil is what's called a multi-wave oscillator. It puts out many, 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 many frequencies, a radio frequency energy, okay? That's pretty high voltage and so on. There's a lot of sparking, there's noise in there, so 
you know all the frequencies you've got. They're not all down in the NMR nuclear magnetic resonance frequency, it's a totally different spectrum that you're talking about, Dave. And uh, it's like a lot of electrotherapy, it's kind of a shotgun, primitive thing, you know, you just blast the system. And I don't really know, frankly, although I've read about Lakowski for years, I've played with his coil. I don't know if anybody has really done a scientific study, first established the full spectrum that now you can do, and Lakowski was doing this in 1920s, there weren't even oscilloscopes to measure the waveform of what you're doing, and do some controlled studies on what it does to normal tissue, what it does to pathological tissue. All that has to be done, really, and uh, Everything I know about it, but individuals like Bob, God bless him, he does good work, and other people who just do it like a alchemical exercise. You don't really have good, you know, good scientific data to find out what's going on. I believe from all the literature I read, from people who played with it, they do get good results. But again, it's like playing with x-rays back in the days when nobody knew what x-rays were and their fingers were dropping off and the nose was coming off and all that stuff. So anyway, that's an area I would not recommend anybody to go into unless they really want to do some scientific work. And it would be very easy to do. You said you're in microbiology, right? No. I mean, you get a few Petri dishes of various organisms. No, I'm talking about the uh, simplest thing in the world to do. Nobody does it, right? You could do the experiment, you get one of those little machines, set up your cultural plates and see what happens to them. Very simple experiment, but nobody did it. The same. Yeah, but you can go with this other thing, the radionics. You can do the same thing using antibiotics. Uh, yeah, the culture you're referring Yeah, same thing. Yeah. No, I'm saying that with the Lakowski technique, we could test it out very quickly, in vitro, right? And with the thing you suggest, that you can do the same thing and test it in culture plates. You know, before you go fool around with my one, you tend to be a little uh, <laughs> I want to ask you about another thing. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> you, you said that this that the, the fall off of this energy yeah. signal, it does fall off, though, doesn't it, with distance? Not the ELF, the regular regular electromagnetic wave follows the inverse square law that is, you know, attenuates the square. there's no fall off with distance? The time. biggest platform we have on the Earth to measure ELF waves is to bounce a signal from here to the inner Van Allen belt and send it back. You can't, it bounces out, I mean, goes out, bounces back, and you can't measure any attenuation. It must have some attenuation. It just but doesn't it, stay here. Is it but it here? doesn't, well, you mean just stay forever? No. Yeah. <laughs> it's another thing, I don't know, maybe the whole Earth's magnetic field is a gradual buildup of uh, ELF signals that just hang around. Yeah, yeah these things bouncing around. Uh, yeah, I know what you're saying, yeah, that, that you just build up a field and it's kind of like filling up a bucket. They, they just stay there. They just bounce it up. Hmm? Yeah. 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 As far as, you notice when it's off, oh, it people are drifting you. asleep left and right. You are? Yeah. <laughs> you and when it's on, they wake up. You know, it goes with. Everybody wakes up. Yeah, you better get that thing. Well, I've to watch this happen. Paul Delgado's stuff is uh, electromagnetic radiation. Right? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Paul Delgado's research is with electromagnetic radiation. Uh, he started out with electromagnetic and he didn't get the results that I told him about. Now he's doing magnetic radiation. Yeah, pure magnetic. He's got the experiment under control. You'll see some of the experimental setup in that on the article. Yeah, I read it. Oh, you got it already. Yeah, yeah. He just has coils around the head, right? Yeah. Uh, you know what he said about distance? I, I'm still confused on distance in this thing. It's like you, when you get rid of your mice, you don't get rid of my mice. Uh, there's there's a, a focus or a distance phenomena involved, but you say it doesn't fall off. I'm still confused on that. Yeah, I know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see, how can I explain this? 
The device I use is a passive device. That means it doesn't have an active oscillator that drives the crystal that I'm using. And I set it up in two ways. One is, just a little bit of the alchemical side of research, I talked to the crystal. I said, um, you know, you've got a consciousness, i got a consciousness. I just want you to do this thing in the perimeter around the house. I don't want to hurt all the little nieces way out in the field and all that stuff, or spill over into somebody else's territory. And I put it out, and I see mice outside of my perimeter. You know, they come out, and they eat, you know, they're all field mice, they're not regular like house mice. So anyway, I didn't do straight ELF uh, engineering, okay? I gotta confess to that. And that is done by a lot of people who play with crystal. Uh, the fact is, if you really want to do crystal research, you gotta think of it as a friend and a pal, and somebody you can talk to, even though they don't talk back to you. So that's one part of the story. Uh, I don't know what would, I would do if I just set up a uh, ELF radiator and just let it go on to infinity. Uh, if it does travel in a straight line, I'm not really sure it does, even though I do a diagram that looks like it, it may just go out to the horizon and take off into the stratosphere, you know, it may not follow the curvature of the Earth. So all this stuff, we don't really know all the answers. Well, what about a guess on, you know, like your neighbor's got three TVs running, or one or none, or you live in a building where there's ten TVs, or you live in a building with no TVs? You're affected by all of them. Um, I mean, am I affected by the TVs downtown, and I live ten miles from downtown? Yeah. Yeah. I don't like that. <laughs> well, that's one of the things that, you know, all of the uh, social structure has to be re-engineered in terms of electrical power, and nuclear power, and toxic waste stuff, and all these things. We're just dumping everything. You know, and remember the, in the uh, medieval days, particularly in Elizabethan England, you know, you had a little crock in the house as a pot, right? There was no running water. And when you filled it up, you just threw it out the window. You didn't care who was under you and the street would smell and the flies would come and so on. That's the way we are with our various types of pollution. When it's not much different than they were in medieval times. What they got, incidentally, in case you're interested, you know, the great plagues of 1480s in Europe that wiped out half the population, what they got for this business of dumping garbage, you know, swill, out into the street was the Black Plague, and it killed half of Europe. And uh, if you read that period, there's a book written by Barbara Tuckman, I forget the author, but the title of it. Anyway. But there was, she described this period a sociologically. Huh? Mirror of History? Mirror of History, that's the book, yeah. And it sounds like the age we're living in, now, except we got smart, we have toilets and plumbing and we don't dump stuff in the front porch. Actually, we're yes. dumping everything else into the environment, you know, that we don't really understand. And uh, who would listen to a guy like Steiner, right, 1925? Because he had no data to back it up, he just had authority. But, you know, that authority doesn't go very far in the face of a industrial revolution where all the people are rushing out to get rich and you know set up industries and empires and colonial it's amazing how tesla could anticipate in that uh, article he wrote with center magazine on human energy Isn't that the greatest article you oh, ever that's my he described yeah. all the pollution that we're going to hit ball the sod for using coal and depleting the reserves and putting up carbon now he did something else i thought was very interesting i mean he looked at education and vibration and energy, he looked at food as energy, of course, and he equated all the aspects of human existence in terms of some frequency of energy. Yeah. And that somewhere along, if he didn't have it or we would, somebody would come up with probably what the proper mix would be. But you see, what makes it so strange is that everything is equated in terms of radiant energies or yeah. wave energies or particle energy. You know, the most important thing he pointed out in that article, and everybody here should know this, he said one of the greatest retardant forces in civilization is war, wasteful, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. He said the only way to get rid of war, since everybody secretly loves to be a hero and have buttons and badges and hats and march with the drums and all that stuff, and finally you get medals. He said, you know, you can't get rid of that. Uh, you can't get rid of that side of human nature. So what you have to do 
is automate all weapons. And you know, he had the basic patent on submarine guidance systems and rockets and so on and so on. And he said, the day will come when all wars will be fought by automated instruments. There's somebody press a button and the rocket goes off, another rocket comes up and they fight it out and they both fall to ground. He said, when the day arrives and man has perfected this technology where there's no hero stuff for individuals, there's no medals, there's no bands, there's no cheering, he said, and everything is like a, a machine robot type of war, then wars will end, and I believe he's right. And we're getting close to that area now. So in many ways, I cheer all these uh, uh, rocket systems and satellite systems, because the closer they get to automation, I believe that what he says will be right, that war will cease. It becomes pointless. Set the momentum of your own. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, here's an interesting sidelight. I, I got some. Blow that up. <laughs> the, uh, I got some uh, research papers from, uh, what, what is it, uh, SRI, Stanford? Yeah. And they were, they had a contract uh, with the Department of Defense to build one of the most sophisticated uh, war gaming simulators that's been built so far. And it had, uh, they used artificial intelligence techniques so that one person could play three robots, or two people could play two robots, or four people could play. And anyway, to make a long story short, it had, it had you know, very impressive graphics, visualization capabilities, and everything. And they took a, they took a war college uh, students, and they took uh, field staff and different people in there. And the, um, the level of realism of the play was so high that they had to report uh, to the Pentagon that they could not get anybody that played the game to escalate it to a nuclear confrontation. Not anybody, not, not a seasoned uh, veterans or theoreticians or anybody. So the Pentagon went back to him and said, skew your parameters. <laughs> Make them escalate to a nuclear confrontation because if they don't do it, they won't know how to handle it when it really happens. But I thought that was kind of encouraging. Wow, yeah, that, that humans do chicken out when the escalation gets so tense they really can't operate anymore, right? I mean, that's what they're saying. That's right. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was like it, it, there was, you know, things. I thought the war games ought to be mandatory for every senator, every member of the House. Really? I've got well, particularly well, the president. The president. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you say chicken out. Why do you say good sense out? Or, you know, it uh, sounds like. Uh, I don't like that chicken. Why don't they just all of a sudden realize it's good sense not to, you know, escalate? Uh, the chicken runs away when it's head's already off. You're asking for common sense. Yeah. <laughs> you never get it coming. You see the cruel and controlling fact why we don't kill ourselves is because someone's afraid to kill himself or kill somebody else. But they're not afraid to kill each other. You know, yeah. They love to go out and smoke. I mean, I was in the Army. I was in there for seven years as a military medical officer, etc., etc. And if you had a suicide mission, believe me, you could always get volunteers. They love suicide. But you ask for volunteers for KP or the motor pool, forget it. Nobody wanted to be just another dull servant. It's amazing how this crazy uh, spirit of being and dying, going out in flames, the common cause of spirit, is so deep in us. We don't take it in a... Well, that's, that goes pretty back in Indo-European patterning and programming. Yeah, they love to club people on the head, right? The Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. <laughs> But that's a great moral failure. The part we should learn, learn more about yet. Um, I'd like to go back to a question that I had last night and see if I could respectfully push you a little further. For okay, try to push me. <laughs> um, I was asking about just what the prophetic message is in terms of, of nuclear commentary, and yeah. you were wanting to hedge on that. And I was wondering if either there is. Then he said, like, you're going to say something more, but I think we went off on some interesting... Well, let me just address myself to that part of your question and give me okay. the rest of it. Um, as I told you, and I know with you all here, there's many, many, about 200 hours of conversations with these extraterrestrials all through this tape recording system. I've had other conversations through a channel that we use. Her name is Phyllis Schlemmer. She lives in Israel. And there's a book written about it, which is forbidden to be read in the United States. And I mentioned it briefly yesterday. It's called, uh, I don't know, a little more space again. Anyway, it's called Briefing. Brief 
anything for the landing on planet Earth, okay? Let's write it all out so we can try to get it. Now it's published in England only by Corgi, and I think it came out in 1979. But once in a while you can find it in some books. Sorry, we can't get it published because, you know, we're forbidden to talk to the public. We're bad people. Who anyway, knew? in that book, there's a whole outline of all these conversations. Part of it answers your question. I can give you the bottom line. We've had many discussions with the Nine about nuclear war. And starting in 1952, that's when I first bumped into the Nine, they said they would never allow humanity to use nuclear weapons. I'm talking about a war, not just testing and all that. And uh, every time there is a threat on the planet of somebody going ape with the idea of starting a nuclear war, my colleague, who's Sir John Whitmore, it's all in this book, from England, and Phyllis Schlemmer from Israel, myself, go to different parts of the planet. We've been to Russia, we've been to India, and China, and all over the damn place. Whenever something looks like it's going to blow up, and we go there and we do nothing but meditate, we have a fixed target, we know what we're meditating on or who, and we don't know whether it works or not, we have no way of telling. If you have a null result, uh, you, know, you don't know. It's like the farmer out in Iowa, he says, you know, I got this whole thought way of, of getting rid of wild elephants on, on, on our plains here in Kansas. And the guy said, well, how do I know? I never saw any white elephant, uh, big elephant. I said, see, that proves it. We kept them away. That's why you've never seen them. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of position we're in. So it's a very strong thing, and it's, it's emphasized to us over and over again that, you know, if worse comes to worse, they will step in. But until that time, they allowed people like myself, my colleagues, and other people on the planet who are into the peace idea uh, of doing what we can to abort an event. Okay, and there's a lot of stories I could tell you about that. And so I am firm in the belief that there will be no nuclear war, even though if you know a lot about nuclear war, you go bananas. For example, any of you know that there were 53 false alarms in 1983 where our computers and radar said Russian missiles are coming in, all traced back to circuit chip problems, uh, all, all sorts of mechanical failures. Yeah. Yeah, ridiculous stuff. So anyway, and then there are blow-ups of missiles in silos and, you know, we have a Pershing missile on the German front and some crane is handling the thing, the damn thing falls off and blows up and kills so you know, all that accidental stuff is always around and very little of it ever gets in the papers as you know unless you're right in a military setup you know what's going on and i know some of that because one of the psychics i've trained works full time for the u.s government going around the planet finding out where follow-ups have occurred in nuclear missiles nuclear uh, fissionable material is stolen here and all sorts of crazy stuff goes on all the time. It's unbelievable. And knowing that, you'd say, my God, it's got to be an accident someday. It's got to be a blowout. But I'm just telling you from the bottom of my heart that uh, that's what I'm told and I believe it. I don't think there's going to be a nuclear event. Now, okay. you have a, she had another part to her uh, question. Oh, part. Oh, oh, I mean, the, the author of that book is uh, Phyllis Schlemmer. No, no, I'm sorry. It's Stuart Holroyd. It's a professional writer that we oh. hired to do the book. Stuart... Sorry, I didn't give you that. Holroyd. H-O-L-R-O-Y-D. It's a little, I'm a pretty good little book. You might find it interesting. Too bad it's not available. There we should start a little underground press and get it around. Yes, I'm sorry. You get the no, other. absolutely. The only other part was I was wondering if you might be able to say anything about why you couldn't say anything. <laughs> so, you mentioned the I word just, secret a couple of times, and I was thinking, you're, you're fighting like the devil just to get this information out. The only people who practically will allow you to speak 
are these people, kooks, more or less. They had existed in Hitler's time. They had been shot. They're, they're laughed at now today. Why not tell us? No, the reason I was hesitant was that it was such a switch of subject for what I was trying to speak about last night. That, and it's such an emotional subject. Nuclear war, nuclear death, wasted planet, nuclear winter. I just didn't want to swing into a whole new subject. Today it's different. I mean, we can switch subjects, you know, at will because we're all kind of getting together in a mind link here. So I'm willing to talk more about it. Yeah. And the other thing is that uh, the other thing is that uh, human beings are human beings, and somebody like me says, "I'm talking to the mind, and we're doing this with the teeth." Boy, this guy he's a nut or he's a maniac, and why should I listen to him? And blah blah blah. You know, the suspicion that somebody might not be, you know, straight and simple and telling a straightforward story. So that's always a problem, and that's why I don't speak about it very often. If I had network time and could reach 60 million people at a shot, I wouldn't mind going up there and they could shoot me afterwards if they got my message out, right? But it, it's a very t delicate thing, okay? How do you reconcile their position that if human choice keeps leading us into, you know, what we set into motion keeps being towards those directions of nuclear disaster, but this sounds like there'd be some kind of intervention, and how would you reconcile that with... No, there isn't. They don't need a theme, that's a threat. I want to make that very clear. It's a very okay. important okay. point. Okay. They will how can not you help me reconcile yeah. they won't some kind of intervention or some kind of, we won't let that happen with yeah. not violating free will? They don't question. try to override human will at any point unless it's at such a point that they've got to reverse it because there's no other means available. Meantime, they rely on human will to do the job, yes, okay? which I think is great. And all I wish we had a million people who would work on this, even if it's yeah. daily meditation. And that's where I could see a danger in saying, well, from the bottom of my heart, this isn't going to happen. That's what I've been told, because then people can get lazy and Immediately, right. They don't realize that in order for it not to happen, you have to maintain yeah. a certain level of energy and belief and, you know, actual force that will present the thing. Right. Uh, yeah. But, um, well, I was just going to ask you, I wasn't here last night, and I don't know if everybody else was here. Not everybody. And the, 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 the nine that you're referring to, I wonder if you could oh. very briefly <laughs> <do that. laughs> All right, let me... Let me 30 seconds. <laughs> no, I can't really do it fast. I spend a little time, I think. Just the facts may clarify the situation. Uh, back in the early 50s, actually about 1950, uh, I was in New York City. I lived in Maine, had a laboratory there, was doing animal work and human work and Faraday Cage and so on and so on. And I was young, I didn't know that much, you know. A lot of brass, but not knowledge. So one of the things that happened was I was in New York City, and I went to a reception given by a very famous lady in parapsychology at that time named Mrs. Eileen Garrett. And she had as a visiting guest from uh, India, a nice little guy in a narrow jacket and so on, uh, with glasses, and you know, it could have been anybody's uncle. It was nothing conspicuous. And he was very quiet, and uh, we met in the corner, and I asked him, you know, what he does, and so on. He's from the University of Pune, and he's here on a peace mission, and so on, and so on. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm studying parapsychology. I'm trying to find out the ultimate reaches of the mind so I can finally design a brain. I mean, that's where my head was in those days, right? And uh, so he said, well, we must get together. I said, how long are you going to be in the country? Oh, he said, I'll be here for about six months, and maybe I'll get a renewal. So I said, fine, I'll get together with you. Well, I left them, and other events intervened, and six months went by, a year went by. And every once in a while I think, gee, maybe I'd call him up, but I didn't. So one day I was up in the uh, upper Westchester County area visiting with the former vice president of the United States, Henry Wallace, who was a good friend of mine. We did a lot of agricultural experiments together. And we got stuck a little bit on the statistics of an experiment we were running, so I missed the train. I was going to take back to New York City. and. Uh, I missed it by about two hours, and I did have an appointment in New York City. 
So he rushed me to the nearest town, which was Pleasantville, New York, known for Reader's Digest, put me on a train there, and I got on the train, and I sat down, kind of running all day, you know, and the last guy gets on the train, he comes late, and it says, Dr. Vina. He sits next to me, he says, oh, he says, huh, time for, you know, the Indians talk a little high-pitched voice, and say, hey, it's time we ought to get together, right? And I said, yeah, I guess so, we've been caught up with. Make a long story short, I invited him up to uh, uh, my laboratory in Maine, which is near Rockland, and he came in by plane, one of my colleagues had picked him up, he walked into the house, which is a very famous Stanford White place, huge, and walked into the library and sat down, and without giving us any warning, went into trance and started speaking. We are nine principles and forces, personalities, if we wish, and we planned this to the altar of blah, 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 blah. And they start telling us about who they were and what, the history and if they were interested in helping us to further evolution, okay, that's how it all got started. And uh, so we got excited about this because it seemed like very high quality information, particularly the mathematics, which some of it to this day we have not solved. I might add almost 30 years later. And, uh, and I, I then began to learn about the big problem of peace and danger of nuclear war, and Dr. Vina took me down to Washington and, taught me how to meditate on the whole congressional hall and you know how to calm their feelings of the president, blah, blah, blah. I went through this whole training period for about a year. And then my colleagues joined me. And Dr. Vinod went back to India, and that was the end of, of talking to the nine because he was so source. I later found out from his wife and from his sons who went to Princeton and somewhere else to get PhDs that uh, he had never done trans work. He was a religious leader besides being a professor uh, in India, but he had never uh, uh, done anything. In fact, is in the culture he was brought in, if he went into trance, was abhorrent. I mean, that was bad, bad stuff. It's like being a witch in a Catholic uh, church, you know? So they were surprised that he'd had this experience. So anything, anyway, 20 years went by, literally, and there was no word from the dying or anything happening. And then, as I told some of you about my trip to Israel and finding out that Lori Geller was backed by an extraterrestrial civilization, and he moved my <coughs> watch by just going like this over it, and then I began to get information directly at that point from the nine to the clock. But I didn't know it was information. All I know is the clock stopped and started. It took me from 19... 72 to 1975, about a three-year period to crack the code, and it turned out to be a rational code, and the reason I was sure it was the right code was that it was predicting events that would happen in the future, very precisely, and I'd wait till the time came and events would happen. So I gradually built up confidence. I didn't tell anybody about this until about 1978, and I began to talk about it to a few friends, and I finally released all the information about the nine and about the tapes and about the clock business in 1982. And that's the thing I mentioned to you earlier, if you want to get the tapes, you can uh, write for them. So my uh, association with these nine principles that run the universe, which they said you can think of us as God, but we're really not a single unitary you know, person. We're just principles, abstract formed and we created the universe and we destroyed blah 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 and we did <laughs> all this sort of stuff. It's pretty heavy stuff, you know, to it's like Moses being talked to by Yehovah from the mountaintop. And uh, a lot of UFO contacts and experiences and uh, so on. So that in a nutshell that gives you a picture of what it's all about. Okay? <coughs> There's a lot more to it, but that's the <laughs> Um, thinking about that wheel, you know, the, and cracking the code, and how there are 22 Hebrew letters, and there are 10 numbers, and then there are those four And there's numbers. like stops and punctuation marks, actually 38 divisions in that code wheel. Okay, so those spacers were to punctuate? Yeah. Okay. And with the Hebrew letters, and different ones would find those messages. And I'm sure there's the significance of who signs. 
We seem to hear more about messages where the guy at the end, the pump or whatever, the sign of the... Well, the ones that sign are the ones that I have told some of you uh, are the leaders of the nine. They're the Aleph, the beginning, and top, which is the end of the nine. And uh, they always sign the message if it's an important message. Sometimes I just they given short information, very short, and it's not signed. But all the important stuff, particularly predictions for life on this planet are always signed. Thank you. Uh, you notice that it's a little awkward to talk about this thing because it's kind of a personal thing. And it's like somebody talking, telling you about their prayers. I'm not making prayers, but a lot of it is privileged communication. A lot of it is clearly stated. This is secret and not to let anybody know it and so on. So, it's a continuing relationship. Yeah, but how much related to where have you gotten the pattern? How much is related to predetermination, and how much is non-predetermined? Or is there some okay. formula? Let me put it this way: in this scheme of things, there is no predetermination in the sense that there's some artificial, mechanical, non-volitional thing involved where. Uh, you know, it's like a stochastic process. You get into motion and you can predict certain outcomes and they're going to happen. You can't change it. Uh, they, the nine, speak of the most important principle in the universe is free will. Nobody can override anybody's free will. And, uh, for example, they tell me that uh, when I get this information, from them. I'm free to act on it as I wish. I still have the free will, and that's very important. They also say they're not overriding my free will. They said, before I came into this life, I agreed to do this job. And so I'm just carrying out what I already agreed to. Nobody bent my arm. Free will choice. So the, the whole the situation is free will. For example, I have painted a rather dismal scenario that the uh, you know, nine had given me as to what's going to happen, and I've gone into some of the mechanisms. But they also say, a very recent conversation, that uh, mankind, and I mentioned this last night, has got so much potential in terms of what he can do that he can override this whole scenario and there's no determination. He will make his future. But again, that in a way becomes a probabilistic or stochastic process and that it can't happen just because one person is going to do it, or 10% of the population. You've really got to get a majority of the people that say, we're going to do it, and we're going to straighten this thing out. Now, in a democratic society like ours, there's absolutely no reason why if all of us decide to do something, no matter how impossible it starts, we can go out and do it. I mean, I'm absolutely convinced, and it's not wishy-washy thinking because one of my roles in the modern world has been to illustrate the power of the mind. That's why I've worked with these great psychic surgeons who carve you open and take pieces out and put pieces back in and people like the other who've done metal bending and others who do teleportation and dematerialization and so on and so on. So all these things are little indices which almost anybody can learn to do as we found out. Uh, that that you have the willpower, that you're not just a little bag of jelly, that there's no real <coughs> motive force. And it isn't just the grip of your hand. I mean, you can exert your force, you know, across time and space into the future and the past and so on. But we don't really accept that because we don't, you know, we're, we're brainwashed not to think that way. And yet anybody who's walked on fire or just decided they're going to bend a spoon or going to levitate this thing, Given enough time, they'll be able to do it. And now we have techniques where we can teach people these things very fast. So my ba basic answer to you is that very much like the entire quantum mechanical world, which is all based on what they call uncertainty, but which really should be called free will. Every little particle does have free will. Human beings and dogs and cats and elephants and everybody else absolutely has free will, and they can use it. 
Yeah. Now you may not, everybody may not succeed. You may start out with a thousand people and maybe 900 of them will do what to be accomplished and maybe some of them will be casualties along the line in various degrees. The nevertheless, the impossible dream, you know, to quote the, uh, the man from La Mancha, uh, it is possible. And I think if we had the opportunity, we had a little time, we don't have much time, these things are coming on us fast. If we could get several generations somehow educated in this way, you don't have to do it in school, but you can do it through media, through a lot of personal effort. I think we could turn the whole situa situation around, really do, and there would be no you know, negative things, and I cited a lot of those. So, yes, Donna. Don't you think there's something to show great corporate residents saying that there seems to be a positive yeah. kind of feeling that is occurring globally uh, yeah. with people starting to think positively and yeah. think they can and can't uh, and it seems to be driving from various parts of yeah. the world. As I said earlier, it's very easy for us in a democratic society, I mean, outside of a few characters like myself who get stopped by the authority, well, not too bad, I'm still alive, I can't complain. Uh, most of us can really go out and exert our influence and our will. Unfortunately, in totalitarian societies, you know, you get lined up against the wall, you get the peg out of line. Iran is a good example. Russia is not so bad, but, you know, Russia, China was pretty horrible during the Maoist period and so on and so on. But uh, at least, thank God, in this society, with all its true perfection, we do have that thing built into the Constitution that, you know, You've got to be pretty darn wrong for you know you to be stopped unless somebody just decides to assassinate you or something quick and dirty. But uh, we have that potential and we should use it. You mentioned like stopping nuclear accidents or problems that somehow people go somewhere and meditate or they, they take some action. And this is sort of like the using of free will. But it's, it's like uh, they're on the side of and cooperate with somehow people who are going to do something sane apparently. So that the people who act uh, out of, say, sanity aren't necessarily uh, acting on their own. They're being helped um, by other by, by these beings. So my point, I guess my question was, it seems like you imply that they only act through human beings. If they don't just independently zap something somewhere, you well, have to... I had made that point yeah. very clearly before because they say that we would rob you of an opportunity, speaking as a group, as a race, not individual, of really bootstrapping yourself. So it's not to our interest that we want to see you develop and evolve this will that will, you know, do the right thing. Now, there's all kinds of wills. There are negative wills, there are murderous wills, and so on. They're talking about the ones who really want to help the evolutionary process on this planet. But it's like, the um, thing is, uh, they, they, they are limited by that then. I mean, that is, say there's something needs to be done, there's nobody handy to do it whose will it is to do it who's a human being. But they don't go out and do it themselves. But it doesn't get done unless some human decides to do it. Right now, I'm putting it a little differently, and I already stated this. They give man the first chance to solve the problem. And okay, okay. let's say somebody's going to press a button and really start a nuclear war with Gaddafi or whatever. Okay, that's good, yeah. They will then step in because they don't want the whole... So they will step in. Yeah, they will step well, that's, in. That's nice to hear. I hope it's true, you know. Well, yeah, we don't know. We won't know until after the effect, of course, like prediction and prophecy. But I'm just saying... And here, it's a matter of faith. They said that over and over again, that they will not allow this particular planet to be destroyed by a nuclear weapon. But yeah, you got a question, boy. Oh. Yeah, I have yeah. a bunch of them. Is John Lilly's Council of Nine the same thing as your nine? He talked about the yeah, Council of Nine. I don't think so. Uh, I know John very well. Uh, John is in a very peculiar state. I don't know whether you know what, about what he does, but not in the last couple of years. I know the last thing that on and off of a drug called ketamine. Yeah. Which is, and when he's on the drug, it's no big secret. I mean, everybody knows it. And when he's on the thing, he's impossible. And when I say impossible, he literally, absolutely, I've been with him when this happened. God, you old son of a bitch, I challenge you. I'm stronger than you are. I'm more powerful. <laughs> and that's a bad side of human nature when you lose humility, especially in the presence of the Creator. 
And uh, he's not in bad shape right now, but he's had little problems. He's lost his uh, dolphin yeah. research lab and a few other things. But they're not the same nine. He's, uh, forget it. He's, he's on a, the other side of the fence. Do you know what happened to Marshall Moore? <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> I don't. She also was on ketamine, yeah. incidentally, when she disappeared. That was an interesting therapy they had going there. Right? Yeah. But I mean, he was using like 500 milligrams or something like that, and they were using something like 25 milligrams. Yeah. I don't think it Well, it's uh, discovered that this uh, ketamine, which is an anesthetic for yeah, dogs, it's, it's, it's a uh, hypo in dogs, and they use it as a hypo in, in the hospital, right? It's it's an animal, mostly. So, and if they give you like 50 milligrams of it or something like that, it puts you to sleep. But if you take about 25 or 15, you get into a double reality. And you sort of drift, it's sort of like an acid high, but you don't, it doesn't rip you out. So, <clears throat> they did this research for years, uh, her and her husband, and then they went to John Lilly to talk about it, find out, to get some insight, and he says, oh, don't touch the drug, it's very dangerous. You know, well, well, I mean, you know, we've been doing it for five years, and be, everything's fine. No, 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 no. I had a friend, went off the trip, drove off a cliff, all this stuff. And he said, what, what are you doing? He said, about 5,000 milligrams or something like that. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's funny the man's alive, the way he can choose I'm amazed that he's alive because uh, he gets so out of hand that I mean, I've been out there to rescue him. He just takes whatever money he has or credit card, gets on a plane and goes somewhere. And last time he did this, he wound up in Hanover, New Hampshire because he went to Dartmouth. And he was just picked up on the street like an old vagrant bum, you know, just staggering around, didn't know what the hell was going on. Fortunately, the police that picked him up took him into the you know, Dartmouth Medical Center, and one of the uh, residents was smart enough to recognize that it was famous John Lilly, and he called up a bunch of us in New York to rescue this guy, take him into our hands and, you know, get him dried out. So we did, and got him into a drying out clinic, and eventually got back home. He starts out all over again. It's pathetic. You know. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask you about four questions. Answer them all or none or whatever. Uh, first of all, Tesla spoke of humanity or people as meat machines. I wonder if there's anything you can say about that. Second, uh, the pyramid shape, is that, can that be considered having to do anything with these uh, frequencies as a focusing point. Uh, third, I, I'm sure you've heard about this Philadelphia experiment, yeah. invisibility with the warship. Yeah. Can, you make, can you give us some information about that, yeah. if you know anything? I forgot the last one. <laughs> That meat machine. The what machine? Meat machine. Huh? Tesla. Tesla used the term meat machine. Oh, I'm sorry. You're talking beings. about the article. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the mechanical aspect of nature. Mm -hmm. Well, what he did was he said this, and it's kind of a startling statement: yeah. that men are material. You know, we're chunks of. Uh, physical chemistry and he called uh, that the meat machine or the mechanical side of person but he also pointed out that there was a non-mechanical part of us which involved truth and beauty and the spiritual side and so on so he was aware of both aspects of man he didn't you know no, he didn't just talk about the mechanical aspect of man so that's one point. The other point you mentioned is about the pyramid and the relationship to the CLF stuff. Now that's a very interesting question. Nobody's ever asked me that, so it may, might be interesting. I went to Egypt in 1976, before the Russians came on the air. And I went there actually, I never told anybody this, but I'm getting older and I just well. it. <laughs> the Nine asked me to go there and meditate and pray for peace in the Middle East. It was about to blow up into a major war at the end of, or mid-May. And uh, so I went there and I got permission to stay in the Great Pyramid for two weeks, six hour, uh, 12 hours every night, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. 
and I just meditated all night, but after a while you get tired, you know, you can't meditate forever, right? So I get tired a couple of hours. And I had some equipment and measuring stuff with me, so I went around and I measured the Great Pyramid for acoustic resonance. And I found out that the focal point where you start the, the sound rolling through the Great Pyramid is just, uh, as you enter the uh, King's Chamber, there's two portcullises, and right in between, and there were supposedly big stone things that came down at one time, and right in between I found the resonant point of the Great Pyramid, and I measured the thing and found out it was eight hertz, acoustically, acoustic resonance, I think it would reverberate. And if ever, any of you have been in a Great Pyramid, the daytime is like being in a railroad station. It's noisy, every echo amplifies, rebounds, and so on. But at night, it's so quiet, you can hear an airplane going overhead through all that thick stone. So anyway, when it resonated, it's like a big violin resonant chamber resonating. I mean, really, it really was quite an experience to be in the mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, stuff. So then I had to calculate how this could be a resonant frequency for the Earth's magnetic field, you know, 7.82 hertz. And I, I worked that all out in terms of when the resonance occurred, the crystal lining, you know, the granite lining would flex and that would cause a minute uh, magnetic field and that would... So that was one experience. The other experience uh, was at the same time, as I was up from 6 at night, 6 in the morning, I had to sleep during the daytime. And uh, I found out that it's more and more convenient to sleep by the side of the pool than to be in this hot little cabin room. And stupidly, I'd fall asleep in the sun, and when I get really sunburned, which I did in this case, skin comes off of me in sheets. I don't know if some of you may have this experience. It just peels off. But I kept wondering why, after the third day, this stuff wasn't just coming off me in big sheets like alligator skin. And so I was in the pyramid night after night after night, and this stuff never came off, first time in my life. So I left, finished my job there, and I went to Athens to do some work at the Parthenon. And God, I wasn't in Athens but six hours when I began to peel, I mean, layer after layer, I looked like a snake, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I found out, uh, you know, by reasoning and biochemistry and so on, that being exposed to this eight hertz it hurts resonance in the Great Pyramid, that it was a health-giving thing, which I subsequently proved in cancer and other ways, and it kept my skin cells alive. They didn't die from the ultraviolet and the burn and the exposure, right? So that was a very big lesson to me. Yeah, but uh, they did slough off. Huh? But they did slough off when you started. Oh, it did slough off, but well, as long as I was in the Great Pyramid, nothing sloughed off. But when I left, I didn't have the daily therapy. See, that was the point didn't have the daily eight hertz saving my skin, but as soon as I went away, I just like an old mummy, I had to pretend to go away. Well, yeah, but in other words, though, if you suffered from a trauma, a of some kind, and you would say I had an oscillating hertzian thing with you, it'd be sort of like a pacemaker. If you shut it off, it, uh, you know, I mean, all this stuff is right there. Well, this this was like that. It was wow. keeping <laughs> keeping this stuff alive. This is though you kept something fresh in the refrigerator. You took it out, and, you know, it rots. Anyway, the interesting thing. Now, the third thing about that question is I then got very much involved with the whole pyramid system around the world. I went to Mexico and I studied that great pyramid with Hugh Harrelson, a great expert. I went to China to study the great pyramid system there. By this time, I had portable, sophisticated ELF equipment. And I found out that in every Chinese pyramid, there's a kind of a temple platform in front of each pyramid. And when I measured the ELF field there, it was 8 hertz. If I moved 20 feet away, or even on the pyramid, I got all the lake, local 50 cycle junk from the power line. So I finally worked out a theory that these pyramids built around the world were used to stabilize the 7.82 earth resonance. And these people knew whenever they built all these things, we still don't know when the Great Pyramid was built, they were able to manage the ecology of the plant by managing one simple frequency. So, anyway, that's the whole thing about that. There's a lot more to it.
Uh, what was your third question, sir? <laughs> Philadelphia Experiment. Oh, Philadelphia Experiment. And okay. I just remembered the fourth one. Uh, <laughs> you know, Tesla died January 6, 1943. He died in his bed in New York Hotel. Immediately thereafter, uh, May, well, a maid came in hours later and found out he was dead, and they called the FBI and the police and blah, blah, blah. Well, the point is that uh, Tesla had given annual interviews to New York Times, New York Herald Tribune on his birthday about a new weapon this and a space shield and all kind of talking Star Wars stuff in those days, <laughs> the 20s and 30s. And he, I have some of his private correspondence. He actually offered these defense weapons to the United States, to Canada, to Great Britain, and he wanted like seven million dollars or something to build a whole goddamn thing to have a shield against any invading aircraft or rocket or whatever. And everybody thought he was nuts. He was talking to artillery people in the government, literally. They had no idea what this was all about. So when he died, though, we were in the middle of a war, right? 1943, the FBI took all of his documents. And the reason I know this is years later, I was asked by his executor, which is his nephew, who was the ambassador, the Yugoslav ambassador to Washington, to try to get back the uh, papers from the government of Tesla. And we worked at it for two years, and they used me because I could talk the lingo of these idiots in the government. And we got the stuff, and it was all shipped back and put in a museum in Belgrade. But uh, the government, uh, I, I know the guy who was in charge, I know the two FBI guys who were still alive, believe it or not, and they gave me some of the papers that they stole themselves. I said, oh, I like this paper. No. So that was saved. Uh, somebody, I know the guy who was the director of the Philadelphia Experiment, secret, nobody ever found out who he is. And somebody decided that some of Tesla's technology, in other words, if you had, in those days they had big coils bigger than this thing, all stuck on the side of the ship, hanging like little life jacket things, you know, what do you call them, lifesaver. And Tesla had worked out a method that by putting a magnetic field through these coils that you could neutralize the Earth's magnetic field exactly, and therefore the enemy, the, at that time the German submarines were magnetic detectors, couldn't locate the ship by magnetic detection called target invisibility. So um, the Navy started this experiment in October of 43. In other words, just enough time to steal the document, get a program going, took an old ship in a Navy yard that already had Gaussian coils, and they you know, had all the measuring equipment around, and somebody threw the switch to energize the coil. And what happened surprised everybody to this day. The ship suddenly disappeared from its moorings in Philadelphia, showed up and was witnessed in Norfolk, which is about 300 miles south, and then popped back into its original berth. And about 200 men aboard, and they all went cuckoo. Some of them were mentally ill the rest of their lives, hospitals. I know some of the men who survived and what they experienced. So that's what the Philadelphia experiment was about. Being in the middle of the war, nobody had time to try to figure out what had happened and to repeat the thing. As far as I know, the Navy never, I mean, they tried, but they never really mounted a full-scale effort after that to try to find out what really happened with that Philadelphia experiment. So that, in a nutshell, is, none of this stuff is in the book you read, right? No. No. <laughs> you won't find it. What do you think of it? Oh, uh, there are... Tesla discovered ways of making objects disappear. This we know. Uh, I know a guy who was uh, from DuPont who was in charge of Navy battery construction and testing. And what they found out, they'd have batteries as big as this thing to run for submarines. That's what they did. And they had certain requirements that they had to, when they threw the switch and shorted out the two poles of the battery, the, all the plates and the electrodes and everything had to withstand the surge of 100,000 amperes. That's an awful lot of juice, right? So they would short this thing, and you know, it was all set up in a way that nobody could get hurt. 
and they found out if there was a wrench left in a room or some piece of metal, it would suddenly vanish. Now this is ordinary workers, DC batteries and so on. Now Tesla did the same, and they found out that metal was levitate and a lot of other things, but the main thing was vanishing. Yeah, the man is alive and he's a very reliable witness, top to part official. So anyway, um, there's another thing that Tesla did that nobody ever understood. <coughs> he took three Tesla coils and placed them upright in a triangle. And when you surge the juice through them, it wasn't DC, now it was AC, that objects would float and uh, things like a wrench would get white hot that you could pick it. It had no temperature, it was just white hot. I mean, it looked white hot, but it was white, but it wasn't hot. He threw it out energy. Anyway, this has been duplicated in Canada. A friend of mine that I'm going to see, I want to see how they're doing with the experiment. So that is part of the mechanism. I haven't explained, you know, why an atom can exist here, a cluster of atoms, and then somehow flip into another space. We call it orthorotation, and they disappear, and they go somewhere else. And they tend to come back to the point of origin. It's like, you know, they flip, they go out, and they come back. Didn't Wheeler have theories about that? Yeah, he had the theory also about uh, yeah, geometro, like metal hydrodynamics, right? But it's explainable in a way, but in a way it's not because nobody could really rationally build the equipment to do it. And I know a number of inventors who are involved. Anyway, I hope that's enough on that. Uh, yeah, you got the fourth one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, after we spoke yesterday morning, yeah. uh, I, I uh, contacted a friend of mine, urged him to come to last night's meeting because I know of his interest. Uh, but anyway, he got, we got it talking, and uh, he said that one of the ways of uh, recognizing an extraterrestrial, and one that yesterday morning we had mentioned something about uh, UFOs and so forth, was that instead of having a pupil like humans do, that there was a sort of a Venetian blind thing instead of the you know the black hole, that, uh, and that this is one way of recognizing them. Now I, I know you had said that uh, I've never personally encountered no, but, but uh, you had put Yuri I on put Yuri board. He did not observe uh, this shutter effect on uh -huh. the things that he saw, but I made it, made it clear that what he saw were robots, they were not people, they were not beings, so it's not a good test. He himself is also, uh, well, I shouldn't say he is not. Whenever he's a bad boy, he's a young kid, and he is a bad boy once in a while, he gets teleported out in outer space and he disappears, and he's thrown back into where we left. And he tells me that when he's there aboard a spacecraft, and is talking to real people in the sense that we understand people, but they do look like real people, and they do have eyes and ears and hair and that sort of thing. Most of them, he says, are much smaller than people. They're kind of little compact, uh, kind of wizard-looking people, you know, narrow faces, sharp points. So at least that's the type he deals with. There must be other types that we have not dealt with. But I don't know about this particular thing. This guy may have run into some group that looks like that. I don't know. What the robots look at? Uh, the robots are kind of cute. They're, uh, they have <laughs> little heads that look like... Uh, they have all this on file somewhere. They have little heads that look like German World War I officers' helmets with a little spike like that. And, oh, yeah. and then they have kind of a head thing that comes, a neck thing that comes straight down. And they go down, they have no arms like this, and they go straight to the floor without any feet. And they do have things that appear to be optical systems here, but they don't have any breathing thing, they have no mouth and so on. And they don't have any apparent ears. And when they move, they just kind of float around, they don't, you know, do what we do with our little two feet. But that's really about what they look like. So apparently there's a whole computer in here, there's a whole sensor system here, there's a brain that computes the information, 
And uh, they say they hang around space for millions of years. They've got pretty good reliability in their <laughs> production. Do you, you know of Tesla? Uh, I've heard a few people who have got the working with Tesla experiments that he actually did have a laboratory to work in from a period from about 1930 to when he died. Is that true? Yeah, that is true. I mean, it was a kind of a secret laboratory, and it was not in the New Yorker Hotel. It was down on Houston Street, not the one that he had on Fifth Avenue. And uh, he did have continual opportunity with We're on people. Houston Street. What? We're on Houston Street. Uh, it was right, you know, where New York University, Washington Square is? Yeah. If you're looking south on the left hand, I don't know the name of the street, you go Green down street? that street and it intercepts Houston. It's about a half block from Houston Street. Okay, I know. In the Houston yeah, I lived there. You lived there, yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's the area. Uh, what else was I going to say about Oh, uh, somehow the word got out that uh, Chester was always poverty stricken. He didn't have any money, he couldn't pay his bill. There's a lot of baloney. He was very heavily subsidized by people that I knew personally, like John K. Salmon Jr., and uh, very distinguished, wealthy people. They, they sub subsidized him until the day he died. Anything he really wanted, unless it was some grandiose, you know, multi-million dollar project, he oh, had. Was this, a, was this a, a blind then? Was he doing this deliberately? Uh, was, Cheney, in her book, talks about the legal, I mean, she went into the court and found the legal proceedings against him. Uh, uh, that were uh, posted by some of these hotels for back payment of rent going for a year or two, you know. And she is this to substantiate that the man was, in truth, either spending his money for something else other than hotel bills. Well, it depends on which period of his life. When you talk about the 1890s, 1900, 1910, he was oh, so, yeah. damn, oh. so damn busy with his research, he just forgot to pay bills. <laughs> It wasn't that he didn't have money, he'd rather spend it on this magnifying <laughs> transmitter the million bucks and pay hotel bill. And so he was like an absent-minded professor, no question about it. But he's not, never poverty-stricken. Uh, he had millions to play with all his life, as you know. But, and, but during the la latter years, well, I suppose you know the basic story is when he starts building that big tower out at Warden Cliff on Long Island, uh, uh, J. Pierpont Morgan's advisors were told, you know, don't back this guy, he's crazy. We'll never be able to collect electric bills if he's broadcasting free power. This guy's got to go. Literally, from that moment when Morgan cut off the money supply, which he did, and the project stopped, which is a historical fact, and things later blown up by the U.S. Navy during World War II, uh, Every effort was made to discredit Tesla. It was an, I understand the process. I've been put through it myself. You know, whispers go around, don't talk to the guy, he's nuts, and inventions don't work. And, and every, there were only seven engineering schools in the United States at the time. The word got out to every engineering school, forget this guy's patent, don't talk about him, don't teach his stuff. Absolutely true. Yeah. And so there was a conspiracy by the, you know, money people, uh, uh, to kind of get this guy neutralized so nobody would listen. But he wasn't neutralized. And I can tell you a story that, you know, I spent my whole life studying Tesla. I met many people who knew him personally and tried to retract every step 